Good afternoon. Rich Nass, Executive Vice President with Open Systems Media here for this week's installment of our Raise In interview. Um, we do this every week, and sometimes Ray and I agree, and sometimes we disagree. Um, this is the subject we're going to tackle today that uh, Ray definitely knows better than I do. Um, has to do with the shrinking number of fabs. Um, it seems to me that every every semiconductor vendor that I talk to um, is is what we call fabless, um, and that seems to be the trend that people just start up a company with a fabless uh, semiconductor mentality, and most of these ICs are, are fabbed in Taiwan. So let me introduce you, Ray. Ray Zin, the longtime CEO of Micrell. Um, what is your opinion on the on this shrinking number of fabs? Um, and how did you do it? Well, because we had our own fab. Um, since 1981, Micrell had a fab. Um, and until I even sold the company in, uh, in August of last year, we had a fab. Um, so I do know that uh, that Microchip, who acquired our fab, um, or acquired the company, is going to turn shut down the fab um, in in San Jose. Uh, the reason I kept the fab here is because I believe that we need to keep the technology, some capability within the U.S. Uh, now, you know, my little fab uh, wasn't going to make a difference in, in the world of semiconductors, but you know, I was just trying to set the vision, at least that I had, about, you know, real companies have fabs. Now, that's not turning out to be the case because we're hearing more and more that the um, companies that are uh, are currently having fabs are are shutting them down. Uh, And and there's two reasons for that. Number one, the technology has been so disseminated throughout the world that you can get almost any technology that you want now uh, uh, vis-a-vis the foundries. So, uh, the, these companies are saying, well, why, why should I put all this money in, in R&D and, 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 and maintenance of these facilities when I can, I can get them and use them whenever I want, and then if I didn't want to use it, I can just don't place an order. So it's, it's more of an economic thing than, than anything else. They're not, they don't uh, see the benefit of having their own fab. So why did you see that benefit? I mean, what was, what was the advantage that you saw? Because I felt that circuits in and of themselves can be easily um, uh, 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 copied. And, in fact, you know, with the new technologies, uh, they can do it within 48 hours. They can actually copy your, uh, your circuit. So um, uh, I thought the only way I could really protect my circuit was to do it topologically, meaning that embed it into the process development. Now, that makes it more difficult for somebody to copy a circuit because, it's unique to the process and the design rules that, that you use for that circuit. Okay. But, I mean, surely you're not saying that somebody like a TSMC would be stealing anybody's designs. No, I'm talking about now those who use TSMC. In other words, they, what they would do is they would just copy your uh, uh, design and, um, and then using TSMC's design rules, uh, they could be in fab within a week. Whereas if you had a unique process that was not uh, held by TSMC, uh, then it would be virtually impossible because TSMC is not going to tailor the process to fit Micro's design rules. So have you, have you ever heard of that happening? Of what happening? People stealing other people's oh, oh, absolutely. Sure, absolutely they do that. that, that's, that that's the problem. Uh, and so, you know, the only thing that protects these large companies is that they already have a foothold with that other company, with their customer, and they have that design in, in-house and, and in place. But when the next revision comes up, you can bet that their competitor is going to be there knocking on their doorstep with, with a comparable product. So that means that the cycle or the life cycle of your product is going to be shorter. So instead of getting seven, eight, nine years out of your product, you may only get three or four. Right, but I, but that begs the question: at what cost? Because it's, I mean, you, some cases you're talking hundreds of millions of dollars for a fab. Okay, but you asked me why we wanted to maintain a fab locally, and we w- we were developing our own, 
unique processes for that particular design. And, and that was one way I saw of protecting the design, to keep it from being proliferated. So, anyways, it was, it was my thought. It was my view of, of why to have a fab. Now, if you go back in history, go back to, to the early days, early 60s, uh, you know, you, if, if you didn't have the fab, you, you, you didn't get the product made because there were no foundries. The foundries actually didn't come into existence until, you know, the, the late 80s uh, and 90s is when the, the foundries really began to, to, to proliferate. And uh, with um, uh, the bigger companies then selling off their facilities, like the global foundries or, or to uh, Jazz or to these other, other foundries, uh, they, there, there were none in existence. There were no uh, uh, fabs. But once these, these foundries became available and had the technology, because when you sell a fab, you also sell a technology with it generally. And, and so they, now these, these, these technologies are now proliferated so much that you can get almost any pro- product you want made through, a, through an outside foundry. And that's facilitated these, these uh, smaller companies that are fabulous, literally, to, I mean, these small fabulous companies to, um, to, to now get into business. When I started my Krell in, in, in 78, there were only probably less than 200 semiconductor companies. Uh, and, and now there are over 1,000. So, you know, it's because of the fabulous model that has allowed th- these thousands of semiconductor companies to, to start up. So would you be comfortable starting a company today with the fabulous model? Uh, I'd have to think about how I would protect my, my technology, uh, my IP. Uh, so would I feel comfortable? I don't know if I'd feel comfortable, but I, I would consider it. Okay. All right. Um, what would be some of the constraints that you would, you would put on it? I mean, is – are there obvious things out there, or, or, or do you really have to go digging to make sure that you're protecting yourself? Well, you really have to. It's going to be more work. I mean, you're going to, there's going to have to be a lot more IP that's going to have to be developed that you can protect you know, solidly throughout the world, you're not just getting a U.S. patent, but getting patents in, in Europe and, and, and in Asia. Um, you're going to have to patent all over the place to, to, uh, to, to protect your product. Uh, I mean, the real problem is, is that these companies can copy things so, so quickly. Uh, you know, um, there's a company called ESS that uh, made sound chips, and uh, they were doing great. They were over $400 million in revenue and uh, public, and, and uh, then the competition came in and, you know, copied their circuitry and, and, uh, in Taiwan, actually, and... Um, uh, took the revenue down below of 100 million, and they went private. In fact, I think the revenue at the low point was like 20 million. So, I mean, it literally put them out of business. So, um, uh, this this happens far too often. Uh, if you look at uh, VLSI, uh, was another company, and S3, and and uh, um, trying to remember a couple of others that were that were doing these uh, these computer chips. Uh, they were literally putting each other out of business every other cycle because the, the technology was so readily available and it was just a matter of, of, of just coming up with a new, new rev, a new design version of, of, the, of, the, uh, of the chip, and they were off and running. So now those companies don't exist anymore. Like chips and technology is another one I'm thinking of. Yep, remember them well. I think they were acquired by Intel. Right. Okay. Well, that is very good food for thought, and um, that's a great discussion for this week. I would like to thank my special guest, Ray Zinn. Uh, you probably know this, but he's the f- longtime former CEO of my crowd, author of a, of a great book called Tough Things First and a podcast by that same name. Hope you have a great day, Ray. Well, thank you so much, Rich, for inviting me. Thank you.